This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by Barracuda. Cyber criminals are working overtime. Last year, in the fourth quarter alone, phishing attacks disguised as COVID testing information increased by 521%. Barracuda has identified 13 types of email threats and how cyber criminals use them to steal money from your company or personal information from your employees and customers. Find out about the 13 email threat types and how Barracuda can provide complete email protection for your teams, your customers, and your reputation. Get your free ebook at barracuda.com slash cyberwire. That's barracuda.com slash cyberwire. Updates from the UK's Ministry of Defense on Russia's war in Ukraine. On influence operations, the advantage still seems to go to Ukraine as Russian efforts look inward. Assessing the effects of hacktivism and cyber operations in the hybrid war, Mustang Panda rears up in European diplomatic networks, ransomware hits a Romanian fuel distributor, Andrea Little Limbago from Interos on data traps, Carol Terrio tracks the fight against deepfakes, and vulnerabilities are found in... UPS devices? From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. The Russian army continues to exhibit surprising tactical and operational shortfalls. Its road-bound heavy forces, even as slow-moving as they prove to be, have clearly already outrun their logistic support. Having been unable to capture key Ukrainian cities, they've turned to heavy and indiscriminate targeting of civilians, despite a second negotiated round of ceasefires. The UK's Ministry of Defense yesterday afternoon tweeted an update on Russia's war against Ukraine and took particular notice of Moscow's attempts to control information. Quote, Russia is increasingly restricting domestic social media access to limit negative coverage of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This will further confine the information space and make it increasingly difficult for the Russian population to gain access to anything other than the Russian state official view. This indicates the Kremlin's concern over the Russian population's attitude to the conflict. End quote. Earlier this morning, the MOD added a spot report, quote, Ukrainian resistance against a Russian offensive toward Kyiv indoors around the nearby towns of Hostomel, Bucha, Vorzel, and Erpin. Russia continues to directly target evacuation corridors, resulting in the death of several civilians whilst trying to evacuate Erpin. Due to heavy fighting in the town, it has reportedly been without heat, water, or electricity for several days. End quote. Moscow is recycling implausible and unsupported claims that Ukraine is attempting to create a dirty bomb, that is a radiological catastrophe, by mining a research reactor in Kharkiv. Sputnik maintains that Russian forces are actually the heroes in Kharkiv, having secured the reactor and prevented the disaster the Ukrainians had prepared. Russian government-controlled media are also claiming that Ukraine is attempting to conceal a large-scale biowar program it's been operating with U.S. support and collusion. Neither of these seem to have any international legs, but then the audience is probably a domestic one. Russian domestic influence operations continue in other respects to rely heavily on censorship. There are also some signs of direct intimidation of journalists. Reporters in Odessa say they've received menacing emails. The Atlantic Council describes what appears to be a coordinated campaign of intimidation. Even the most assiduous propagandists seem to have trouble finding good help nowadays. Some of the emails were sent by people who forgot to delete the instructions that had been embedded in the sample text they were given. Things like, add here a few paragraphs on local specifics, or these emails should be disseminated every day to crush the morale, or send emails individually, not to a list, and think about painful dots to push on. We think painful dots are what Americans would call hot buttons. You know, you 
tell them and you tell them. The biggest obstacle to a successful Russian information campaign, however, apart from persuasion being inherently harder to achieve than confusion, may be the pervasive availability of social media and a large international journalistic presence in Ukraine, unusual Western openness with intelligence, notably used for what some have called pre-bunking, the anticipation of Russian disinformation themes and the release of fact-checks before the disinformation finds its legs, seems to also have played a part. A report late last week from Checkpoint Software gives a timely reminder that in any war, and in a hybrid war especially, early reports and claims should be treated with cautious skepticism. That applies to claims on behalf of both sides, which may or may not eventually be confirmed. Who's helping Russia defend its networks and who's assisting them in recovering from cyber attacks? Huawei, the Indian news service WION reports, Australian Defence Minister Dutton, the Daily Mail says, has criticised Huawei for working on behalf of Russia and accused Moscow and Beijing of having an unholy alliance. The Conti gang, which has publicly pledged its allegiance to Mr. Putin's war, has shrugged off the reputational damage it sustained when it was infiltrated by a Ukrainian hacker who released records of the gang's internal chatter. E. Centire has published an extensive account of Conti's history and an assessment of its current capabilities. Attacks the group conducted against Western targets may have represented a contribution to Russian battlespace preparation. The U.S. FBI updated its alert concerning Ragnar Locker yesterday, quote, As of January 2022, the FBI has identified at least 52 entities across 10 critical infrastructure sectors affected by Ragnar Locker ransomware, including entities in the critical manufacturing, energy, financial services, government, and information technology sectors. End quote. Ragnar Locker was composed by Russophone coders, and MITRE notes that Ragnar Locker doesn't encrypt files if it determines that its target is in either Russia or the near abroad. This makes it likely that its operators have enjoyed a privateer's immunity from Russian authorities. Operators, we stress, is a plural here. Ragnar Locker is a tool, not a threat actor, and it's been used by various gangs. Cyber espionage will follow crisis, and the Russian war against Ukraine is proving no exception. Proofpoint this morning released a report on the activities of TA-416, a Chinese APT also known as Mustang Panda. Its current interests have obviously been shaped by the war. TA-416 is targeting European diplomatic entities, including an individual involved in refugee and migrant services. It uses tracking pixels to help profile targets during its reconnaissance phase. The phishing emails that eventually deliver the payloads to TA-416's targets have often impersonated United Nations agencies. Quote, The multi-year campaign against diplomatic entities in Europe suggests a consistent area of responsibility belonging to TA-416. End quote. Bloomberg reports that ReSecurity found that threat actors succeeded in accessing the networks of 21 companies, most of them in the oil and gas sector, over a two-week period in February. ReSecurity declined to attribute the activity to any nation, but did go so far as to say that the activity seemed to be state-sponsored. Bloomberg notes that some of the incidents appeared to overlap those Microsoft attributed to Strontium, also known as APT-28 and Fancy Bear, that is, Russia's GRU, Military Intelligence Service. The timing and target selection are suggestive, circumstantially, of a Russian operation. The Hive ransomware gang has hit Romania's Rum Petrol oil company, disrupting fuel stations throughout the country. Leaping Computer says that the gang has demanded a $2 million ransom. Finally, researchers at security firm Armis this morning announced that they'd found three zero-day vulnerabilities in APC smart UPS devices. A UPS device is an uninterruptible power supply, something that provides emergency backup power for mission-critical assets. They're used in data centers, industrial plants, hospitals, and other places that need reliable, uninterrupted power. Until recently, UPS devices hadn't been considered security risks, but... That's changed as more of these devices have become remotely managed and so networked. 
Armis calls the vulnerabilities taken together TL Storm, and they say they could be exploited to disable, disrupt, and destroy APC smart UPS devices and attached assets. APC is a unit of Schneider Electric. This is a case of responsible disclosure, and Armis has worked with Schneider, which has prepared and made available patches and mitigations that address the vulnerabilities. If you use these UPS devices, be sure to patch them. And now, a word from our sponsor, Recorded Future. Staying one step ahead of the rapidly evolving threat landscape requires a constant flow of daily intelligence. To stay up to date on everything happening in the world of cybersecurity, join over 50,000 other security professionals who subscribe to the Cyber Daily. With daily email updates on the latest cybersecurity news, top threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, suspicious IP addresses, and more, the Cyber Daily is the first thing security professionals check every morning. To learn more and subscribe for free, go to recordedfuture.com slash cyber dash daily. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Our UK correspondent, Carol Terrio, has been tracking the growing sophistication of deepfakes and the concerns they've triggered. Today, she files this report on a new coalition that has set their sights on fighting deepfakes. So according to Forbes, a coalition of technology companies set up to combat deepfakes has released the first version of its technical specification for digital provenance. The Coalition for Content Provenance and Authority, C2PA, not exactly a name that slips off the tongue. However, according to Forbes, C2PA counts Adobe, Microsoft, Arm, Intel, Truepic, and the BBC amongst the illustrious list of members. And the gist is this. Platforms can define what information is associated with each type of asset. By asset, I mean an image, a video, a podcast, a document. And they can specify how that information is presented and stored and how evidence of tampering can be identified. In other words, it allows content creators to selectively disclose information about who has created or changed digital content and how it's been altered. Leonard Rosenthal, chair of C2PA's technical working group and senior principal scientist at Adobe, is quoted in Forbes saying, As the C2PA pursues the implementation of open digital provenance standards, Prototyping and communication from coalition members and other external stakeholders will be critical to establish a system of verifiable integrity on the internet. (laughs) Okay, that is a statement written by committee if ever I saw one, because it is nebulous at best. But let me just distill what I think it is trying to say. Hey guys, get on board with this, otherwise it's going to fail. But, you know, these things get complicated. They always do. Maybe not all deep fakes are bad. Consider the movies, for example. According to Technical.ly, the big movie houses started using the technology that is deep fakes to reduce the cost of movie production during the Rona pandemic. That, too, is a slippery slope. How long before some actor breaks his leg and is contractually obliged to have a deep fake play his role? Or what if an actor is bidding for a role against a deep fake of Laurence Olivier? I mean, as the technology becomes ever more accessible, organizations will not only be the ones creating deep fakes. Individuals creating content on YouTube and other video platforms may well want to use deep fakes, if only just to make their channel pop. Oh, look, hey, look at the big celebrity that just popped in on my channel. I mean, I can see it. I'm predicting it now. So as always, we want to stop deep fakes for bad intentions. We want to regulate the use of deep fakes in good intentions. And we want to look at how it can be used by the common person in order to advance the technology in a safe way. Not a big ask, right? (laughs) This was Carol Terrio for The Cyberwire.
And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud. SpyCloud constantly recovers and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, a realm packed with credentials, personal information, passwords, and customer information exposed in third-party data breaches, combo lists, and malware infections. With SpyCloud, you now have access to this data that historically has not been available and can take preventative efforts to defend your business against costly cyber attacks and hard-to-detect fraud that can negatively impact your bottom line and brand reputation. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire to learn how to make recaptured data your best defense. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Andrea Little Limbago. She is the Vice President of Research and Analysis at Interos. Uh, Andrea, it is always a pleasure to welcome you back to the show. Uh, there is a term that I saw coming out of, I believe, the UK, and it's data traps. You being a data scientist, I thought you'd be the perfect person to check in on what exactly this means and what the implications are. What can you share with us today? Yeah, no, thanks for bringing this up. It, it really hasn't risen to a lot of attention, but back in December of 2021, the, the UK Intel chief brought this notion and warned against both debt traps and data traps. Now, hmm. debt traps have been used before, and that basically is the weaponization of debt where countries provide other countries loans to get leverage over them. And so we see that a lot. And so that, you know, that wasn't really what was as novel, something to be concerned about for sure, but wasn't as novel as of also sort of tying that into data traps. What they noted it was that you know, if you allow another country to gain access to your data and, and gain control of that data, basically it erodes your sovereignty. And so what he was really was warning about was the access that other governments are starting to have to both public and private sector data as an erosion of sovereignty and, and control and as a means for leverage as well. And so what, what they're really looking at is, you know, is looking at data as basically this resource, right, a strategic resource. And he's framing it in that lens. And I think for many governments especially you know, digital authoritarians that we, we've talked about for sure, you know, really do look at data as a strategic resource. And democracies really haven't done that as much. That's shifting, but really haven't done that as much. And so that's where you see why it was so important for the UK intelligence chief to, to bring this up was to highlight that this is, should be a concern of both the private and public sector, that knowing where your data is, making sure both you know, you're both protecting it you know, at home, but knowing where it is abroad and knowing what kind of access other you know, adversaries may have to that data. And then what would happen to government, to your society, to your company, if that data was accessed? And I think as we all know, you know, within this audience, you know, integrating various forms of data together can really lead to useful insights. So that's great. It also can lead to useful insights in negative ways against, you know, an entity as well. So it really is trying to, you know, raise the alarm about the necessity to protect your data, not just at home, but, you know, abroad. It's interesting to me you mentioned sort of the contrast between uh, democracies and other governments. Um, I mean, is is that a cultural thing? Is there do different uh, nations approach their attitude towards data in different ways? Yeah, I, I think they definitely do. And on, on the one hand, you know, it's kind of a spectrum, and, I, and that we absolutely can point to areas where democracies and democratic governments have overreached in areas of civil liberties and human rights. So it's not saying that democracies are completely you devoid of any kind of activity in that realm. But the extent of which it goes on and sort of the guardrails that are in place to prevent it are very, very different. And so you do see amongst the digital authoritarians really the quest to, you know, yeah, I think of it as data hoarding, bring in as much data as possible. And that's why you see everything from you know, the OPM attack, feels like about a decade ago at this point, you know, through mm. you know, the healthcare data that's getting attacked, through airline data getting you know, taken in, through you know, like hotel uh, membership data, like all that different data basically can be pattern of life when, when brought together uh, and, and can be used for just a variety of means. And that's not even mentioning some of the IP theft as well that we've seen. And so you see more of the authoritarians looking at no target as being off limits. For the democracies, really you know, it focuses much more so on you know, what we do like you know, in quotes, you know, traditional espionage, not necessarily targeting IP or the commercial um, entities, it's more so for you know, the leadership and espionage along those lines versus the theft of IP. And so it does create a very different playing field between the two. And that's really what the, I think the, the UK chief was really trying to highlight was whether it's your company or within your, your digital supply chain and your partners that may have your data 
elsewhere to be really concerned about that. And even in the policies that we see, you, know, you see like the um, general data protection regulation, the EU is protecting data for individual citizens, whereas elsewhere, you know, from Russia to China, Kazakhstan, you really across a lot of these, you know, actually Thailand, Vietnam, many, many, many countries increasingly have data localization requirements. So you have to store the data there. Additional policies and regulations then add components as far as, oh, and we can access this data if we deem it you know, essential to national security. And that umbrella of what is essential to national security basically is endless <laughs> for them. So mm. there's a big risk of storing that data abroad uh, with, the, you know, with the government that could have easy access to it. Well, and uh, you know, we're seeing, I think it's the EU that's been uh, going head-to-head with Facebook over data storage and being able to transfer data overseas, uh, across the ocean, and uh, trying to keep some sovereignty to their data. I mean, is this is that part of what we're talking about here? I think it is, and I think that's an additional component of it, because on the one hand, we do see sort of this, this splintering of, of the internet and the, the different sovereign areas. And so the, really, the, the challenge is how, how can we have the, the free flow of data, because that is really essential for you know, functioning economies, while still preserving you know, sovereignty and individual, individual data rights. And I think in the Facebook case, it's especially relevant for the case of looking at the, the citizens' data and maintaining control over the citizens' data Whereas for some of the other instances, it might be that they may want more so the free flow of data along the lines of commercial information and so forth for you know, economic purposes. And so, you know, not all data is the same. And I think we're starting to get into an area as well where we'll, we'll start seeing some, you know, distinct categorizations of different kinds of data, which will then have different policies applied to them. So, I mean, if we think we have a patchwork of, of policies and regulations now, I think, I think that's just going to continue to explode. Hopefully, you know, it's done well in, in, the, in the direction of, of greater security. But we'll see, because at the same time, there are concerns over you know, everyone trying to create their digital fortress around a country, because that also you know, leads to the, you know, basically digital protectionism, and, and that isn't optimal for the free flow of information ideas either. So there's going to have to be a balance. Yeah. All right. Well, Andrea little Limbago, thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making this CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Arctic Wolf. End cyber risk for your organization with the Arctic Wolf Security Operations Cloud and Concierge Security Model. Learn more at arcticwolf.com slash cyberwire. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Dodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now a word from our sponsor, Code 42. Did you know that there's a one in three chance that your company will lose IP when an employee quits? Cybersecurity teams are facing unprecedented challenges when it comes to protecting sensitive corporate data from exposure, leak, and theft. The annual Data Exposure Report 2022 from Code42 revealed three key trends that are accelerating insider risk. First, the continued adoption of cloud technologies and a lack of visibility into them. Second, the impact of the great resignation and departing employees' theft of IP and sensitive data. And third, the challenges of the new hybrid remote workforce and uncertainty over how to address it. As insider risk grows, Code42's insider risk management approach helps protect data without slowing down business. Learn more at Code42.com slash showme. And we thank Code42 for sponsoring our show.